Republicans continue to debate. Rick Perry's comments on Social Security are becoming a major, major issue. President Obama makes a big pitch on jobs. Does it help his own numbers? I'm Frank Newport, Gallup Editor-in-Chief. I'm Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today. And this is Election Matters. Susan, we're in the midst of a debate season, are we not? Uh, We had the debate last week under the airplane wing out at uh, Simi Valley at Reagan's Library. Now we have a couple. We're taping this on Monday, so Monday night there's one in Florida and another one in Florida, right? Next week, yes, another one in Orlando. So a real chance for the Republican field to take some shape and for Republicans nationwide to see who they like. Social Security, a big issue. Of course, that's what happens. You've followed politics for so long. An issue will take life, kind of. And, of course, people jump on it, the press and other people. Uh, In the debate in California, Governor Perry made some comments about Social Security being a Ponzi scheme and some other comments like that. And, of course, Romney Uh, The other putative front runner has really jumped on it, and I'm sure that's going to be an issue in the next two debates. I wonder if Social Security is really going to be a a uh, a negative for Perry. You know, in the this is my ninth presidential campaign. Social Security has always been a third rail, where a candidate who did what Rick Perry did uh, could count his days were numbered. But Hmm. I wonder if there are signs now that this has changed amid amid public concern about the stability of the Social Security system. Yeah, you know, Susan, I went back and looked at a lot of our data, and we have a majority of Americans who say they don't even expect to get Social Security. And, of course, on a lot of other measures, Americans tell us that they're worried about it. It's either in a crisis or it's a major problem and so on and so forth, that it's going to cause major economic problems. So it seems to me that if Perry played his cards right, he could really kind of be in uh, simpatico with some of these attitudes out there where Americans actually seem to know that Social Security is uh, very shaky in terms of its economic uh, underpinning. So if he plays his cards right, I wonder if he actually can be seen, hey, at last somebody's really addressing the issue, rather than simply saying, oh, we got to preserve Social Security at all costs. And maybe a generational divide on this one, because young people are much more likely to say they're not going to get Social Security benefits. And they're probably right about that skepticism older people are much more concerned about preserving the benefits they have. Mm -hmm. So that's a line that we may watch, uh, see Governor Perry trying to walk. I believe he said that in California. If you looked at the transcript very carefully, check me if I'm wrong, I think he said in there somewhere, if you're 55 and over, don't worry about it, you're going to have your Social Security. So I think, and you're probably right, he'll continue to say that, certainly. Might get emphasized more in these last Mm -hmm. two, in these next two debates. We looked at our numbers that go through Sunday, September 11th, on our Republican tracking, and Perry's still dominant in terms of our positive intensity scores. So we see no no signs yet that he was hurt by it. And I believe there was another poll out just recently uh, by CNN who's doing the debate Monday night, right? So shows uh, Governor Perry still at the top of the field, 30 percent, Romney at 18 percent, and Michelle Bachman, who for a brief moment seemed to be the front runner, down at 4 percent. What a fall. Yeah, her campaign complained, I guess, she didn't get enough time uh, in the debate with uh, John Harris and, uh, and uh, Brian Williams out there in California, but we'll see. But yeah, she's certainly not doing strong in our positive intensity either. Perry's still the front runner based on everything we can see. He's the man to watch. By the way, John Huntsman in negative numbers on positive intensity, that is more Republicans of a strongly unfavorable than strongly favorable opinion. He's not moving much at all that we can see. Yeah, not that. He's trying to go for those moderate Republicans, uh, non-Tea Party supporters, but that may be a niche that no longer exists, at least not in this cycle. What about President Obama? Jobs plan. That's uh, He and his campaign team are viewing that as a major uh, effort, right, to try to recapture some momentum? He took the biggest forum a president can command, a joint session to Congress, gave a speech, but the Gallup numbers show that didn't make a bit of difference. His approval rating remains at 42 percent now, just where it was before that speech. That's right. We looked to see if there might be, I thought there might be an uptick because of the 9-11 weekend where presidents generally get a rally effect, but as you say, it's it's even, very even, and we don't see any change whatsoever. Republicans could be uh, in a little trouble if they totally ignore it, right? Because I think the, everybody got a lot of criticism here in Washington from the debt ceiling debate. So I think Republicans are trying to be a little more careful now not to alienate people by dismissing the idea of doing something legislatively at all. Is that right? Well, that's right. And jobs are clearly a big issue. But this is the time that President Obama really needs to see his numbers start to improve if you look historically. The White House likes to make a comparison to President Reagan, who was down uh, with uh, at approval ratings of about 47 percent at this point in the cycle when he was looking at his reelection year. That's not so much better than 42%, mm-hmm. but his 
approval rating already was on an upswing within a period of a month or two. It was getting over 50 percent and it stayed there. I think that Obama needs to see that same kind of surge going into the election year if he's going to have a happy outcome. Yeah, I look back at Clinton, who's the other example people like to point to. And he actually had one poll, our our, uh, USA Today seen in Gallup poll at the time in September of 1995, before he was seeking re-election, where he was at 44, just two points off from where Obama is today. So that would be presumably heartening to the Obama campaign team. However, as you say, that was actually abnormally low. Uh, Clinton was already up to 48 by the next poll in September in that year, 1995, and he was moving up onto the 50 percent shortly thereafter. So it's really uh, about time for Obama to start seeing some upward movement. Uh, I would think uh, if his campaign team's going to try to have some positive glimmers that he's going to build momentum. We always have to remember that things can change, how much things can change. President, The first president, Bush, at 70 percent approval rating in the aftermath of the first Gulf War at this point in the cycle when he was looking at re-election, but he lost the next year. Yeah, that's when, of course, nobody but Bill Clinton would jump in. We hate to think of 1948, Susan, <laughs> but Harry Truman was actually in the 50% range back in 47. You remember it well, right, in the fall <laughs> of uh, 47. But his approval rating fell all the way into the like the high 30s by 1948, and everybody thought he was doomed, including Gallup, which predicted he would lose. And, of course, he won re-election. So it, what you said, I think, is very important. Things can change. Susan, one last point, most interesting finding of the week. We ask Americans every night in our Gallup Healthways tracking if you have health insurance or not, if you're covered. And about 16, 17% of Americans do not have health insurance. This is 18 plus adults. But you know what's interesting is we broke it out by state for the first half of this year. And guess what the highest and lowest states were in terms of coverage? You tell me. Well, Massachusetts had only about 5% without insurance and Texas had the highest, about 27% of Texans didn't have insurance based on our interview. And then, of course, those are the two states we associate with, Romney and Perry. And what a dilemma for Mitt Romney, because on the one hand, you'd think he'd be bragging that his state only has 5% uninsured, such a good record compared to Texas. But it reminds Republicans that he backed that uh, health care plan, that statewide health care plan that included an individual mandate. It's become so controversial. It's a real dilemma. It really is for the Romney campaign people, because you're right. In some ways, he could say, look at the numbers. You know, I passed the plan, and now Massachusetts has the fewest uninsured people of any state in the nation. And yet, of course, conservative critics will argue, yeah, but that came at a cost of mandatory coverage, you know, the mandate in Massachusetts, and also a lot of expense for the state and so on and so forth. But how does Perry get around the fact that over one out of four Texans don't have health insurance? I guess we're going to hear how he gets around that. Um, talking about what he thinks the appropriate governor, government role is, because you mm-hmm. can make the argument it's not the government's role to provide health insurance, and I think that's one of the views that he says, and that it's not the federal government's role. Um, but this might be an issue that you hear Mitt Romney talk about, not want to talk about so much in a primary with mm-hmm. Republican voters, but that you hear more about when you get to a general election, if he should have that privilege. Absolutely. Well, we'll look forward to talking again next week. We'll have another debate for the Republican side uh, under our belt, and we'll see what, what happened there. That's Election Matters. I'm Frank Newport, Gallup Editor-in-Chief. I'm Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief for USA Today.